The Devil's Manor was the world's first horror film, and it was directed by the man who had also made the world's first sci-fi film, A Trip to the Moon, French filmmaker George Millais. The film may only be two minutes long, but it establishes many of the tropes of the horror genre. It opens on a bat transforming into a vampire, who along with his Igor-like assistant, summons a woman from a boiling cauldron. As our heroes enter, the villains disappear, and then, in a series of trick shots and revolutionary editing techniques, Millier's wreaks havoc on the hero's senses, with disappearances and reappearances of the creatures. In the end, the hero eventually subdues the vampire with a cross, as the screen fades to black. The 1896 film has a laundry list of what would become horror cliches, including a supernatural occurrence, a deformed assistant, a hero whose senses and metal are tested, a friend character who bolts the minute there is trouble, and a partial defeat of the villain, leaving the door open for sequels. However, there are two missing elements, death and blood, but it was only a matter of time before these tied themselves to the genre. The 30s and 40s would be defined by Universal's classic monsters, the 50s by 3D horror, the 60s by Hitchcock, and finally, in the late 70s, it was time for the slasher. According to Horror History by Wheeler Winston Dixon, it was director George Romero's unflinching violence in Night of the Living Dead that gave way to the gratuitous slashers. The earliest slasher examples were Mario Bava's Bay of Blood, Tobe Hooper's Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and Black Christmas, directed by Bob Clark, who also directed The Christmas Story. But it would be John Carpenter's 1978 film Halloween that became the template with its masked villain and final girl. In 1980, Paramount released its own deranged cousin to Halloween, and Friday the 13th went on to massive success. On the heels of that success, Paramount wanted to fill a hole in its release schedule on Valentine's Day weekend 1981, and so it turned to director George Mahalka. And that's a long story. <laughs> when I first came to Canada, when I was 10 years old, uh, I didn't speak English or French. So basically for the first couple of years of my life, I did nothing but sit in the back and stare and watch. That started it. The sitting and staring and watching turned to drawing. Then that turned into uh, an interest in literature. And uh, that turned into an interest in becoming a literature professor. And while I was studying in the university, I started playing with photography. Then video equipment came out and I started creating videos as tools for teaching. I had a friend of mine, Rodney Gibbons, who ended up being the director of photography on Bloody Valentine, amongst a bunch of other films that I made. He helped me with my videos and I helped him with his films. And the dean of the film department at Concordia University in Montreal approached me one day and said, uh, it's kind of funny because your name appears on all these films that keep winning awards and you're not part of our department. Would you consider taking some, some of our courses or becoming a part of our department? And by that time, I was getting a little disillusioned with the educational world. So I took him up on that offer and never looked back. I graduated and I didn't know what to do except I wanted to direct films, but obviously that's a little more difficult to do than to imagine. So I asked one of the jury members on the, the Canadian Film Student Awards, Bob Presner, if he was producing anything in the near next little while that I could get on maybe as a PA. And Bob said, well, it just so happens that I'm going to be producing a film with a French co-production with Alexandre Minushkin, who was sort of like the Goldwyn Meyer or the um, Corda of, uh, of French filmmaking at the time. He did Napoleon, amongst other things. He said, I've got a job as an office PA for you. I said, well, what does that do? And he says, well, you're going to be making copies and you're going to be making coffee and running around. So he offered me $25 a day. That included the rental of my car. He said, you know, if you want to be exploited, no problem. I took the job. First day I walked in, one of my jobs was to make coffee. Well, I made some coffee with those old percolator machines. The coffee was really, really bad. It was undrinkably bad. And just so happens, just as I finished making the coffee, the French producer and director walk in, and they take a sniff, and they go, this is milk. This 
smell it. Shit, what is this? This is not coffee. So it started off really well at the time in Montreal where I was living. The only places where you could get good coffee were in Hungarian espresso shops. So I went to one of the Hungarian ones. So I came back, and the next day, I make this new coffee. And the guys walk in, and they smell, and they go, oh, well, this smells really good. What is this? So they tasted it, and they said, this is excellent coffee. Who made this coffee? So I put up my hand, and the guy said, well, you know where to get coffee, then you must know where to get good food, too, in this town. You are my driver from now on. In the prep process, he was really frustrated with not being able to find the proper locations. He was looking for something, which imagine this. He said, you know, I want something that is, has a sense of oppression and yet has a sense of freedom. That was his description for a location. I'm driving them back to the hotel one day, and he's just bitching, bitching, bitching about how these people are so uncreative and they just do not understand anything about art. All they're showing him is bloody underground garages. So I said, I can't help but overhear your frustration in this. And I've got something maybe I could show you that's about 10 minutes out of the way from the hotel if you'd like to see it. So he looks at me and says, how would you know? I said, well, I read the script. So he said, okay, fine. I take him someplace. You had this huge, big metal ceiling on top of your head that was just dripping with with water and rust and so on. But if you looked east along the train tracks, you saw the whole Montreal skyline and a sunrise. And if you looked west, you saw the other part of the skyline and a sunset. He said, this is perfect. This is exactly what I wanted. Railway tracks, they mean freedom. They mean exit. The oppression of the top is perfect. So next thing you know, I became his uh, location scout. So by the time I finished that movie, I was assistant location manager in charge of all locations. Obviously, Mr. Presner was very proud of the young man, <laughs> to say the least. And about six months later, he called me and said, there's a producer in town who wants to make a low-budget feature comedy about pinball, sort of like a beach party bingo, but with pinball. He said, you know, I recommended you and... Uh, you know, I can set up the meeting. So I went to the meeting and uh, got the job. About eight months later, I ended up directing that film called Pinball Summer, which made a lot, ton of money in Canada theatrically and, uh, and in foreign sales. You know, my usual statement about this is how to become a director, make very good coffee. In other words, whatever job you do, do it as possibly best as you can. And the chances are that someone will notice. That film caught the attention of the Andre Link and John Dunning, who were sort of like the Roger Cormans of Canada. They met me and they offered me a two-picture deal. The first one was supposed to have been a comedy. So we started working on a uh, film called Stitches. Because of my literature background and writing background, I knew a lot of the people who moved on from the Montreal scene to New York and ended up working at the National Lampoon. I got a couple of the guys from the National Lampoon to work with me on this screenplay, Stitches. Unfortunately, the head writer ended up getting a nervous breakdown in the process and uh, ended up writing an 800-page script, to which John Dunning said, I'm not going to be able to finish reading this before we were supposed to have finished shooting this. So we're obviously not going to do this. How would you like to do your second movie first? So I said, well, sure. You know, I mean, all I wanted to do was make films, obviously. So I said, well, what would that be? And he said, well, I've got this one-page treatment that I've already talked to Paramount about, and they're interested in developing it. Read it and let me know. So that one-page treatment was the treatment for my bloody Valentine. So I said to John, you know, John, I've never made a horror picture before. I've never even made a horror short before. And he says, so what? You're a filmmaker. You never made a comedy before you made a comedy. So this was sometime in July. He says, if you want to do it, great. The only problem we have is we need to get this picture out into the theaters by February 13th, which starting on one with one page in July, getting it into the theaters, especially in those days when you needed at least a month to just get the release prints printed. But you know, in those days I was young enough not to really need much sleep. 
and I guess innocent enough to figure, you know, of course I could do this. So he said, okay, fine. So we got John Baird in from LA and John and I started working out this storyline. Obviously Halloween just came out and Friday the 13th just came out. So obviously I, I looked at both of those, but I think Black Christmas is one that I, I looked at more. What I liked about Black Christmas is that it had actual characters and, and, a, and a reality. They were not just dumb teenagers being uh, mowed down one by one. Also, what I liked about Black Christmas was it was, was much more of a whodunit. So we tried to incorporate those ideas right in from the, the time that we were doing the, the screenplay. In the town of Valentine, Valentine's Day has not been celebrated since miner Harry Warden went on a murderous rampage after a mining explosion almost cost him his life. He vowed if Valentine's Day was ever held again, there would be hell to pay. But this year, the younger generation has thrown caution to the wind and are planning a Valentine's Day dance. And sure enough, the murders begin. The two things that I really wanted to do with it was one, use the economic deprivation or the economic decline as part of the atmosphere of the movie and not have faceless suburban teenagers running around getting slashed. And the other thing was, I've always liked Agatha Christie. So a little bit, I don't know if you know the Pen Little Indian. So it was a little bit of that too, so that I wanted to create something that had some social consciousness we really wanted to create a community, a world, where these people are dependent on each other and they are friends. We just sort of also tried to turn some of the usual cliches on its head. For instance, in ours, the fat guy is not the butt of jokes, but is actually the most respected leader and has the hottest girlfriend. And we tried as much as possible to create each character in a different way so that they are not interchangeable and to develop each character just enough so that every time somebody gets killed, we do have a feeling of sympathy for them, which is something that what I found in most of the other horror films is usually the only one you actually have any kind of real sympathy for is the last girl. Once we got a scene-by-scene -scene outline, kind of, then Bob Presner and I, who ended up being the line producer on the show, went out to Nova Scotia to start location scouting for the mine. We found the mine that just closed. It was in perfectly dirty, wonderful shape. So we came back with that information. I worked with John there in incorporating everything we found and how it could be done and what it would be like. We pulled the first draft out. And on that first draft, after a bit of casting, we went to uh, Nova Scotia to start prepping, and I would be going back to, back and forth between Montreal and Nova Scotia. One of the funny anecdotes about that is the little town where we were shooting Sydney Mines, Nova Scotia, economically pretty hardly hit with this. So they really wanted this show to come into town. So they figured nobody wants to have that dirty mine, so they actually ended up repainting the whole mine to make it look brand new. So when we came back, we went, oh my God, what happened here? So we ended up being $50,000 over budget before we ever even started shooting, because we had to get every scenic artist and scenic painter out of Montreal and Toronto to repaint the mine back to what it was supposed to look like. And then we started shooting, I think, sometime uh, mid-September. We got, we got evacuated from the mine like a half a dozen times. Methane leaks out of coal on a regular basis. That's why, strangely enough, a coal mine is not black, it's white on the inside because everything is covered in lime dust to prevent sparking and to keep the humidity in. Mines also have ventilation shafts. They're like chimneys, right? Which clear out the air. Um, depending on the, uh, on the barometric pressure, if you have that very, very low clouds and heavy, heavy pressure, that means the chimneys don't work as well. That means methane starts building up. And that means that there is a potential for either methane poisoning or an explosion. And anything that could potentially spark could set off an explosion. Two pieces of metal knocking together and causing a spark could create an explosion. 
the crew was basically uh, my classmate from film school. I mean, here we are two and a half years out of college and we're making a, a relatively big budget movie. It was an exciting challenge for everybody. I mean, we all knew the dangers, but man, we were all young, you know, I mean, we're all 27, 28 years old. You know, danger manger. <laughs> you know, why would we get killed? You know, one of the other problems we also had was when we arrived at the mine, one of the things they neglected to tell us in all our research was that we couldn't use any film lights down there. Everything had to be safety lights. Now, the safety lights couldn't be more than a 25-watt bulb. That had to be a special bulb that did not have some kind of a gas in it or something. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was basically safety non-sparking. So the only film lights we could use were these little 250-watt inkies, as they were called, that we had to modify so that it would not spark at any time which led us to a big problem because in those days the fastest film available was um, 5247 which was 125 ASA and that was fast in those days we ended up using the same kind of lenses that Kubrick used on Barry Lyndon and then it still had to be pushed which in those days meant a, a different uh, development system uh, the same thing that Bill Zygmunt used in Deer Hunter. So what we had to do was when we had to flash the film, a technique that Bill Zygmunt showed us, Rodney and I went to one of his workshops in Maine. And uh, then it had to be sent to a, one lab in New York City, Chemtone, who did that special extra development process whereby it wouldn't incur more grain because one of the problems with pushing film was obviously incurring grain. What happened was the film would get shot, then every two days, some fly that negative to New York City, where in New York City they would develop. That would then be shipped to Montreal, where it would then be printed as a work print. Then John Dunning and Andre Link would look at it and then send it back to us. So usually I was shooting blind. Um, what I shot on Monday, I might see the next Monday. And so a little bit of the rushes, sometimes what they did was whenever it was a kind of a kill or something interesting, they would do double work print and send that to Paramount. But aside from that, there was really not very much supervision at all. We were shooting under the supervision of John Dunning and Andre Link. As a matter of fact, we got notes back from John saying make it more violent. The, the scene where uh, Sylvia gets uh, hung on that shower hook. We reshot that because John didn't think there was enough blood. A great deal of our budget was spent on the special effects. It was Tom Berman who was doing the special effects for us. The height of, of practical special effects, we pushed that to its absolute state-of-the-art limit. We wanted to create a lot of these in one shot. One of the things I wanted to do in this film is to show that violence actually hurts. It's not just pretty. One of the things that I didn't want to do was to do commercial beauty shot of violence. I wanted to make the violence nasty, quick, and painful. So we designed all these, these kills or these effects to be able to do it in one shot. So, for instance, when Happy gets that pickaxe under the chin, and it comes out his eye socket and the eyeball comes out. That was all done in one shot. John Smith is on the line, and I don't care what's on the line, Howard. You have got to say what we know in the booth. Yes, we have to say it. Remember, this is just a football game, no matter who wins or loses. An unspeakable tragedy confirmed to us by ABC News in New York City. John Lennon outside of his apartment building on the west side of New York City. The most famous, perhaps, of all of the Beatles. Shot twice in the back. Rushed to Roosevelt Hospital. Dead on arrival. Hard to go back to the game after that news flash, which in duty found we had to tell. Frank? Indeed it is.
John Lennon was shot in the back by Mark David Chapman outside of Lennon's New York City apartment. The event made America take a look at its cultural makeup and brought about a gun and brought about a gun debate that Ronald Reagan quickly dismissed and brought about a gun debate that Ronald Reagan quickly dismissed. President-elect Reagan was in New York City today. He said John Lennon's murder was a great tragedy, that an answer to crime in the streets must be found, but said he did not believe that Lennon's death amounted to an argument in favor of the control of handguns. Reagan was with New York's Terrence Cardinal Cook when he spoke. Uh, well, as I said, what can anyone say? It's a great tragedy, and it's just another evidence of that we have to try and stop happening in this world. Did you stop that with handgun legislation, Governor? I've never believed that. I believe in the kind of handgun legislation we have in California. Uh, someone Your commits a crime and carries a gun please. when he's doing it, he had 5 to 15 years of the prison sentence. According to George Mahalka, the act of senseless violence against Lenin also affected the MPAA's rating of My Bloody Valentine. The MPAA, Motion Picture Association of America, was formed in 1922 in an effort to curb government censorship of Hollywood films. And so Hollywood formed the association for self-censorship instead of government. And in 1968, they set up the basis of the rating system we know today. In the 80s, Paramount Studios and its horror films were in a bit of a bind when it came to getting the right rating for their films, according to Mark Bernard's Selling the Splat Pack. The economic and public relations problems that dealing in an X or unrated fare could cause Paramount were brought to life on the 23rd of October 1980, when critics Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert devoted the entire episode of their television program to starting a campaign of moral outrage against slasher films. The Boogeyman. He's going to get you. And we're out to get the boogeyman before he gets you <laughs> and your four bucks. Now, week after week, these are the kinds of movies we're getting. It is relentless. Every film company seems to be making one of these movies or distributing one that some fast buck artist has already made. In addition to the films we've already mentioned this season, we also have He Knows You Are Alone, Motel Hell, Phobia, Mother's Day, Schizoid, Silent Scream, and I spit on your grave, which is easily the worst of this disgusting bunch. The newspaper ads for these films are bold in the way they suggest terror, but in no way in many cases do the ads really prepare you for the kind of explicit violence we end up getting on the screen. Decapitations are not uncommon, and shots, repeated stabbing shots of all parts of women's bodies are grotesquely routine. You know what I think misleads a lot of people when they look at the newspaper ads or ads on television for these movies, they see that R rating oh, and yeah. they think, well, R, that means if you're under 17, you have to like, take along a parent or an adult guardian. It can't be that bad. Mm -hmm. Maybe they've seen other R-rated films, like this summer you had The Blue Lagoon and had a little low-key nudity in it, or The Blues Brothers, mm -hmm. which really wasn't too extreme. And so mm -hmm. they say, well, that's not so bad. They have no idea. I agree with you about I Spit on Your Grave. That is the most violent, extreme grotesque, nauseating R-rated picture I've ever seen, and I just don't understand how the R rating has grown so large as mm -hmm. to include these films, which in my opinion go right off the map of any kind of good taste. Yeah, what's happening is these gougings, again, to make the point, are taking place, and they're basically, basically women that are being gouged. Uh, I think at this point somebody is probably wondering why. Why? Why exactly. now? Why is this happening? I have a theory. In the last couple of months that I've been seeing these pictures, I'm convinced it has something to do with the growth of the women's movement in mm -hmm. America in the last decade. I think that these films are some sort of primordial response <laughs> by some very sick people of men saying, get back in your place, women. Uh, these women in the films are typically portrayed as independent, as sexual, as enjoying life. And the killer typically, not all the time, but most often, mm -hmm. is a man who is sexually frustrated with these new aggressive women. And so he strikes back at them. He throws knives at them. He can't deal with them. He cuts them up. He kills them. Get back in your place. It's against the women's movement. I think you're basically right, Gene. You know, after you've sat through hour after hour of this complete trash, you begin to ask yourself, what did these female victims do to deserve the horrible attacks they mm -hmm. undergo in these films? What was their crime? 
why is it suddenly open season on young women in the movies? Well, one thing that most of the women victims do have is in common is that they do act independently, and I agree with you on that point. Mm -hmm. To one degree or another, there are liberated women who choose to act on their own, and the w moment that a woman starts making decisions for herself in these movies, yeah. you can almost bet she's going to end up paying with her life, and horribly. As to what people can do about these films, this trend in the movies that we've been spotlighting, I think that people have to realize that the box office speaks louder than just two film critics. So if one of these films is around, if you have an idea that it might be around, stay away. Right. And how do you know which films to stay away from? Usually you can tell by the ads. R-rated, usually has a knife or a hatchet or an axe, a girl screaming, some guy in a hood. Yes. These movies are junk. Give them a pass. Okay. So much for this week's journey into sick movies. Next week, <laughs> the films have to get better. How can they be any worse? Next time, we'll review five new films on sneak previews. Until then... We'll see you at the movies. Even worse, a vast majority of national critics joined Siskel and Ebert's campaign. This backlash put Paramount in a difficult position. They wanted to make more money by exploiting what was now a marketable title and producing more Friday the 13th films. They also had to worry about including too much gore and graphic violence in the series. However, they had to provide just enough violence to please the viewers for these films but not enough to get an X rating and encounter difficulties in the marketplace. One of the things that happened was, and this is, this is my theory about this, December of uh, 1980, John Lennon got killed. All of a sudden, there was a major, major backlash against senseless violence. Generally, and, and when we've seen this, when John Belushi got a drug overdose, well, then everybody was against drugs in Hollywood for about six months, and nobody did drugs. Well, it was the same kind of reaction at the time to uh, this violence, and because of the fact it was so highly uh, realistic in one way, obviously pushed to its limits, but still, in a way, very probable. For instance, when the kid gets his face burnt off or boiled off, that was in one shot. There was nine layers of different makeup on his face that was all water reactive. And what we had was obviously some bubbles coming out from the bottom of the pot. The pot bottom was, uh, was plexiglass. So if we kept them there long enough, the first layer would peel off and then the second layer would bubble and the third layer would turn pink and the fourth layer would turn red and then so on and so forth. One of the problems we had, obviously, is when the time came for the MPAA to look at it, there was no way to cut some of these things. The MPAA was not happy. There was, I think, two things that affected it. One, this was a Canadian film. There was really no incentive for the MPAA to be lenient on it. The combination of the two made us the whipping boy example for uh, Jack Valenti and the MPAA. So the MPAA basically said, you got to cut this out and you got to cut this out and you got to cut 10 seconds of this and five seconds of that. The problem we all had was that while we were doing this, we were already mixing and cutting negative. So even if there was an alternate shot, that negative was already cut. When you're cutting negative on a 35 millimeter film, the first frame and the last frame of any cut is destroyed once the negative has been cut. You can't just splice them back together again. What we ended up having to do in many places was basically just pull the whole shot out and only leave the aftermath or only leave the initial impact. But there was no way that we could cut back to somebody else and cut back to the thing. If you look at Halloween, if you look at Friday the 13th, Generally, what would happen in those films is someone would raise a knife and slash it towards the camera. Then there would be a cut to the knife entering the body, then cut back to whoever is pushing the knife, then cut back to the knife in the body, and so on. One of the problems was for us is that we also had the what they called the penetration, and it was the penetration that got them going. So in other words, if you slash the knife towards the camera and then just see the knife already in the body, that was okay. Watching the knife actually slide into the body is what was not okay. And that was my point in this movie, was to actually show that, because that, to me, was the horror of actually having to witness the reality of this. There was a time when, when we actually got a note saying, cut 
from here to here. And we said, why? There's nothing there. There's nothing left there. But one of the things that I also worked on was sound in this. Sound has always been very dear to me. And I worked at Burbank Editorial for three weeks, creating all the impact sounds and all the sounds of kills, including the breathing of the miner and so on. They basically ended up almost uh, censoring our sound because there was no image left. It was just basically a, a reaction shot of while this violence was going on, but the sound was still there, and the sound gave the impression that you could still see it. So that was kind of crazy. So we tried and we tried, but there was no argument with them whatsoever. By that time, Paramount has also sunk in so much money that they couldn't just decide to let the film become an X, because that's what basically the, uh, the MPAA said. There's a quote which has been attributed to Valenti. According to our editor at the time, it was, tell those Canadians to take their movie and go home. An X would have meant at the time that the film would have been shown in about 100 porno theaters. Paramount had so much money involved in it already, and so did John Dunning, that they couldn't at one point argue anymore, and they just needed to get this film out by February 13th. If they would have held back three months, you know, by the time Halloween 2 came out, or was it Friday the 13th 2, or whatever it was, I, I was shocked on how violent and bloody and gory it was. Because obviously, you know, People forgot about Lennon, other things happened, everything you know went back to where it was. So the problem with Paramount and everything else was they were invested in this as a Valentine's Day release. And because of the fact that it was done so fast, by the time they uh, realized there was nothing they could do, the money was already spent, it had to go out. So I don't blame Paramount, I don't blame John, I don't blame anybody. No, I mean, the only people I blame is the, uh, the MPAA, you know. And I can't really blame them either because they have to do what they felt was right at the time. Um, it really killed me. It really, really, really killed me. The frustration stood for a long time, you know. I mean, for a long time, I just didn't, obviously, after having made Bodie Valentine, um, I got a lot of offers to do horror films, and I refused every one of them. I mean, one of the things I wanted to do with this film was create this natural deer hunter-like universe and then add the horror to that. Without it, my point was, you know, this is not my bloody valentine, this is my anemic valentine. It, it really affected me, you know, I mean, way more than it probably would now, you know, obviously by now I'm pretty well aware of that's the business, you know. Um, I mean, I, I did it because, you know, I've always prided myself on being a professional. I didn't pout and I, you know, I didn't stamp my little feet and I didn't walk out of the door. I kept doing what it needed to be done to make sure that the film got out. Not particularly liking it, as a matter of fact, hating the idea. And, um, I really didn't want to make another horror film for a long time afterwards because of that. You know, I ended up making a French language comedy next just to get it out of my system. So it wasn't it wasn't uh, it wasn't a pleasant experience, let us always say. Especially since we were encouraged to go that way to begin with. John Dunning was as devastated as we were, so it wasn't like I was in a vacuum of devastation because we all expected this film to do very, very, very well. Every indication was that this was going to change the, uh, the way horror films are made. One of the problems was, if you're gonna to wanna to see The Deer Hunter, then you go see The Deer Hunter. If you wanna see a horror film, you're gonna go see a horror film, right? What we tried to do was this strange hybrid, but the horror fans aren't getting their kick because, you know, all the money shots, shall, shall we say, are no longer in the film, well, you know, it didn't do well as well at the box office as it could have. And the only reason that I think that this film has got the legs it has is because of the fact that its unique atmosphere and its unique treatment of the story to the point where 
you don't really need to see the graphic kills to get the feeling and the mood and the atmosphere. And it still keeps you on your toes and keeps you guessing. And there's enough jump scares in it still that make it work. You just didn't get that cathartic moment of the 10 seconds or 15 seconds of the bloodbath. The, the, the biggest memory of it is the love and the community that we created while making the film. I'm still very close friends with all the cast members who are still alive. We try to get together at least once a year. That, that to me, is the, the, the lasting effect of it, is the, is the wonderful friendships and, and love that, that still exists around that film. But the fact that the film has, has now, you know, what is it, 37 years or something? Each year, it, it tends to go up on the list of classics. It gives people emotion and, uh, and, and joy to me is the most, most uh, satisfying thing about it. It's a bad time, this time of year. How many times is he going to tell this story? Oh, let him tell it. I love fairy tales. This ain't no fairy tale, little girl. If you don't take it seriously, you're a fool! <laughs> the first Valentine's dance in 20 years has to be something special. Look, Landers, you gotta get a lot of exercise if you're gonna grapple with Gretchen. Oh, yeah? Well, I got a Valentine for her that she's never gonna forget. <laughs> This town on Valentine's Day, everybody loses their heart. Roses are red, violets are blue. One is dead, and so are you. It can't be happening again. Stop! It can't be happening again. What's going on over in Valentine Bluffs? It looks like Harry Warden's back in town. It happened once. It happened twice. Cancel the dance or it'll happen for twice. In the town of Valentine Bluffs, there are many ways to die. Take your pick. Bloody Valentine. Harry Warden failed to become the next iconic slasher, but Freddy Krueger was waiting in the wings. And in 1984, he was immortalized in The Nightmare on Elm Street, directed by Wes Craven. Craven was no stranger to the horror genre. He had made the depraved Last House on the Left in the 70s. Here's an interview that Craven gave discussing Last House on the Left with NPR's Fresh Air. It's not the sort of movie that I would go to, I don't, I don't believe. Uh, at the time that I made it, it was not the sort of movie I went to. Uh, my feeling when I was making it is, okay, if um, these people are going to be paying money to go in and see somebody killed, which in effect you're doing when you, what anybody is doing, if they go to a movie that they know is a, a murder thriller, then they're going to see what I feel uh, this business is really like. As I mentioned the, the someone once before, it was during the height of the, of the Vietnamese War, uh, and I felt like uh, America as a, as a whole country, as myself, was uh, becoming immune to violence. We were watching it. I literally was watching people dying on my television screen while I was eating dinner, you know, and, and several times caught myself, you know, with mouthfuls of food and, and nausea coming over me. What, you know, this is horrible. I mean, this is really horrible. And even when Blood does come, did come out, when they first came into the movies in a big way with Peckinpah, he used slow motion and the squibs somehow weren't really very stylized and ballet-like. And uh, I still felt like it, you didn't really get down to the essence of the act, and that was depriving a living thing, a, a human being, of its life, of its very life force. 
And, I, I, you know, it went beyond a simple matter of pulling the trigger. You had to look at that thing struggling to maintain that life, even though it had been shot. It went back to something that happened to me when I was a kid. I don't know whether you'd be interested in hearing it, but um, at one point in my life, when I was living in, in uh, you know, uh, kind of a poor neighborhood, we lived next to a, uh, a railroad yard, and I don't think I'm probably looking back on it, was very happy with my life. But anyway, one thing I found to, to sort of get rid of my craziness was I, I, I got a mail-order bow and arrow set. I mean, a, a, you know, a legitimate one, and I started hunting. And the only thing to hunt there was were rats, because the railroad yard had this area where they kicked grain out of uh, cattle cars, and there were a lot of rats. And I started almost by accident, started hunting rats. And it went a whole year before I got near to even hitting a rat. It turned out they were extremely canny, very, very alert. And I never got close to one for the first six months because it wasn't that good a shot. But I kept practicing and kept hunting these things and kept wishing I would get one. Finally, one evening, almost dark, I took a shot at a rat after stalking it for half an hour, after sitting quietly and waiting for it to come out just right. I shot and I hit the thing. And instead of, and at, at that moment, at this little tiny animal let out this enormous scream that echoed over all the boxcars in, in, the, in the stockyard and, and, and chilled me to the bone. I, I realized that what I had been thinking and fantasizing was totally different from what I had actually done. And not only that, but the thing was still alive. And I went down and I said, well, this is a rat. You know, I, nobody likes rats, and, but I had to kill it. And it took a lot of killing to kill that rat. And it continued screaming for a long time. And I tell you, when I was done, I was totally drained. I was totally shocked by what, not only what I had done for amusement, but how fiercely that thing struggled to stay alive. Each of the big three slasher franchises would be in an arms race of sequels. Michael Myers would have six films by 1995, Freddy Krueger would have seven, and Jason Voorhees would have a whopping nine. This bombardment of sequels had diminishing returns at the box office, and it left the characters predictably stale. They all desperately needed reinvention, and the final installment of Freddy Krueger during that period would do just that. Wes Craven would return as a director in Wes Craven's New Nightmare in 1995, a meta, heartfelt love letter to horror films and their sequels. The film is self-aware, but lacks any cynicism. Craven even plays himself. Marcus, Colin Mark. I'm doing a film about my nightmares as I'm dreaming them. In order for the movie to continue, it, it was dependent on me having more nightmares. Well, fortunately, I did. I'm a little frightened by what Wes may have tapped into. I frankly felt that it was over when we did the last, the final nightmare. I think that only happens in the movies. It happens when the story dies, the evil is set free. Now that the films have ended, the genie's out of the bottle. That's what the nightmares are telling me, and that's what I'm writing. This is still a script we're talking about, right, Wes? He's decided to cross over out of films into our reality. The only way to stop him is to make another movie. Oh, my God. The bad man's getting awful close. The film is well regarded now, but at the time it floundered at the box office. It would be Craven's next meta effort, Scream, that was an industry altering smash with $173 million at the box office. Every studio wanted their Scream. It even seeped into franchises with entries like Halloween H2O and Jason X. Jason Voorhees had one of the more eventful decades, with basically three relaunches in the 2000s. There was Freddy vs. Jason. Friday the 13th, produced by Michael Bay, but the first was Jason X in 2001, written by Todd Farmer. Farmer was a horror fanatic. Halloween was the film that affected him the most, and so he started his career in the right place, working for the original director of Friday the 13th, Sean Cunningham. But for a period of time, Sean Cunningham didn't want to do horror films anymore. Dean Laurie, who had written Jason Goes to Hell, and Dean introduced me to Sean, basically just to help me get my foot in the door. Working for Sean Cunningham, he would say, and I can't remember exactly how it went, but you need to have a titty or, a, or some blood every 10 minutes, every 10 pages. That was his rule, which is not a bad rule for a horror movie. But uh, I don't know that I necessarily followed that rule. For me, even whether it's a scary movie or anything else, it's all about the characters. Sean, at the time, didn't want to do horror. So we were doing 
about, you know, writing scripts about delinquent kids in Spanish Harlem and courtroom dramas. Finally, I said, dude, I'm from Kentucky. Let's just do horror. And he was in development hell with Freddy versus Jason. And so we started talking about doing another Jason movie. I just happened to be the, the writer on hand at the time. So it was just dumb luck. I was in the right place at the right time. Once on the project, Farmer decided to give Jason a little reinvention. I remember being in the business, like when I started, it was just before Scream. Scream changed everything because everything became self-aware. And I mean everything. All movies were suddenly Kevin Williamson's self-aware kind of things where it's all, you know, inside jokes and that sort of thing. And that was fine. I mean, Jason X ended up doing some of that because Scream had come out. But there was this whole big sequence in, that took place in Crystal Lake. It's a virtual reality Crystal Lake. But that was it. And as a means to distract him by using the 1980 files, they pulled up his mom and they created a VR version of his mom. And she's out in the water in Crystal Lake. She's drowning. And so the kids are safe because suddenly Jason turns and he goes out there to save her. And when he gets over her, he stares at her for a minute and he, he dunks her and he holds her under and she drowns. And I always thought that was great because I was like, he's, he's, you know, they brought him back, but this is a new version that they brought back. You know, he's no longer loyal to his mother. And, and both Jim and uh, Sean were like, no, you can't kill his mom. And I was like, we are the gods of our world. We can do anything. I was young. <laughs> so, so anyway, that's how that, that did not happen. For me, it was to kill him, you know, half over halfway through the movie, and then bring him back as this monstrosity that that is unlike the Jason that we saw before. I mean, that was that was never supposed to be on the poster, and it, was, it wasn't something I ever expected anyone to know. I thought that'd be the big surprise. People come out of the movie and goes, "Oh, you got to see this because this thing happens." I don't want to tell you, but it was on the poster and it was on the in the trailer. So it's kind of if I knew they were going to do that, I would have just done that a lot earlier. But. That was my my attempt was just to make a physical change and not just a physical change. I wanted there to be a an, an emotional change as well, which is why I was showing that he was willing to drown his mother. Jason X was slated for Halloween 2000, then March 2001, then summer, then Halloween 2001. It finally came out on April 26, 2002. The tenth Jason film grossed just 13 million dollars at the box office. Although, a copy was leaked online, and it made the list of the most pirated films of the year. Yeah, it sat on the shelf. We did it in 99, I think, and it didn't come out until April 2001, maybe? I forget. I don't have the dates in front of me, but I know it's, it sat on the shelf for a while. Part of that was that DeLuca had been our, uh, DeLuca was running New Line at the time, and he was our, you know, he was our, our exec, he was our champion. And when he left the company, it just sort of sat there. There was no one else there to champion it. Not uncommon. I mean, why would, if you're new to the company, why would you champion somebody else's old work? And uh, so it just sat there forever. And finally, I think they just decided to get it out there. The slasher film in the 2000s had its ups and downs. Remakes and reboots were all the rage. Even Prom Night and April Fool's Day got a remake. A few relaunches were successful like Halloween and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But none could truly reestablish the franchise. 80s horror had taken over the 2000s. And so, Harry Warden was given the chance to live again. I had no idea that it was being made. Um, by that time, the rights were sold to Lionsgate. And um, I found out about it because uh, I got a call saying that would I like to do a, uh, a director's cut of My Bloody Valentine? Through that, I found out that one of the reasons they were doing that was to prepare it as a promotional tool for the, the remake of My Bloody Valentine. Patrick Lussier, editor on Scream and Wes Craven's New Nightmare. I found out they were going to remake My Bloody Valentine when I was... Uh, working as a film editor and, and visual consultant on The Eye, which starred Jessica Alba and was over at Lionsgate and went in to show uh, Mike Pasternak and Peter Block and maybe John Sackey. One of the latest cuts as we were recutting it as we'd reshot like over a third of the movie. And that was the day they closed the deal on doing the remake. Uh, Mike Pasternak had worked, I think, as an executive on the original back in the 80s. 
and had long been a big fan of it. As they hung up the phone and I was standing there, you know, waiting to show them <laughs> um, some recut scenes and things like that, they were like, hey, uh, you want to direct the, the remake of My Bloody Valentine? And I was like, absolutely, I would love to do that. At the time, I was just like, My Bloody Valentine, I know I've seen that. Which one is that? Is that, uh, like, I remembered those 80s genre movies, particularly uh, The Prowler and Happy Birthday to Me and Terry Train and Prom Night and My Bloody Valentine. There are all these sort of great murder mystery slasher films of the early 80s. Then My Bloody Valentine, I think, is one of the, like, the best of the group because it has such a great iconic killer and a great setting. Uh, George Mahaka and uh, the writers did a great job. Uh, realizing, you know, that whole mining town vibe. We wanted it to really be a revisiting of w what those movies were back when, when I was, you know, uh, 17, 18, uh, when all those movies came out, when it was a big deal to go see these horror movies, which were so much fun to get a bunch of kids together and go get scared. And, uh, and that they were more than just gory. That was part of the roller coaster. Certainly the murder mystery aspect. And we wanted to, you know, pay a tribute to George Mahalo's film. You know, the original version, uh, uh, you know, we set out to basically do a, a shortened version of the original in the first 10, 15 minutes of the remake. We didn't want to just say, oh, we're taking the title and now we're making a movie about something else. Uh, we wanted to uh, be faithful. Um, you know, I think one of the things about My Bloody Valentine when we made it um, was just, you know, there are a lot of horror remakes. I think people forget, you know, there is a period of time where, where remakes were getting a bad name and, and, and people were like, oh, it's just a remake of this or it's a remake of that or it's, it's you know, forgetting that Three of, I think, the best horror movies ever made are remakes. You know, uh, the 1978 Invasion of the Body Snatchers with Donald Sutherland and uh, uh, John Carpenter's The Thing and David Cronenberg's The Fly are all remakes. And everyone's brilliant. I'm not saying Valentine is anywhere near as good as those films. I would say it definitely isn't. Um, but at the same time, the idea of taking original source material and telling another version of it plays are put on and performed differently all the time. Um, you know, we were uh, all became students of the original My Bloody Valentine and fans of the film and respected the film and the filmmakers who made it and wanted to to do something that that in no way took away from it, but only expanded upon it and perhaps would point people to finding it. Um, and maybe someday somebody will do another version and do that for us and do that for the original again. Um, you know, I think uh, watching uh, Carpenter's The Thing makes, uh, you know, I went back and watched the, you know, the original with James Arness, and uh, sometimes people judge remakes harshly because they feel somehow they're, they're discrediting or uh, disrespecting the original films, but for me, that was never the case. You know, th this was always about doing another version of telling a similar, st similar variation of the story, but knowing and respecting the roots that were there, and making it, you know, with different technology in a different time, and 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 telling the story in a slightly different way. I think that's an important thing for for fans of the genre to uh, to take to heart. You know, stories are cyclical. Uh, they come around, uh, you know, again and again, and there are always For going centuries, to be For centuries, there has been a legend of a land untouched by time. Authors have written about it. Explorers have vanished searching for it. And one man will set out to discover the truth. A journey to the center of the Earth. It wasn't just science fiction. It was inspiration. Looking good. Sweet audience. Direction is my sixth sense. Yeah, the problem with Patrick Lussier became because 3D was so gimmicky. Nobody moved. The slightest change in pressure can cause it to shatter. <laughs> it's actually thicker than I thought. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, but the other one was the Miley Cyrus, Hannah Montana, best of both worlds in 3D. We all went and saw that, myself and the DP and the producer and the production designer. You know, the Hannah Montana of it aside, the 3D was really beautiful. And the 3D showed us a lot of things that were very intriguing. Uh, we shot some 3D tests. None of us had done it before. Brian Pearson, the DP, has since done a lot of 3D movies. You know, the test showed us a lot of interesting things to try. You know, sort of the contra zoom where you're, where you're zooming in and dolling out at the same time, which we do in the film in the cage sequence. It's such a strange effect. It's so exaggerated. You know, that sort of vertigo effect of the reverse dolly zoom thing. But in 3D, the, the entire world swims around you. And we discovered very early on that 3D is all about um, sort of corridors and, and, and hallways, or that's why shooting in the grocery store, we scouted to find the grocery store that had the really long aisles that we could shoot in because the aisles look great in 3D. Technically, we were wrestling with just trying to make all the 3D work and stuff. We were every day basically doing things that hadn't really been done before. So um, it was it was technically a, a challenge every day just to get through the filmmaking process. And of course, you know, when you're dealing with native 3D and, and things are out of alignment until you can get them in alignment, it's, it's like a multiple Advil day as your brain is being ripped apart. Um, you know, wrestling with 3D until you can get the 3D all, all in the in the right space and in the right alignment, so it doesn't cause your uh, your eyes to try and uh, rebel against your head. Brian Pearson, my my director of photography at the time, would be like, I have no idea what this looks like. There's no way to tell. And I just saying to him, we have to keep going forward. It doesn't matter. We just have to get out the other side. You know, the mine looked great in 3D. You know, we talked about building mine, but we didn't. The budget for building a mine was something like eight hundred thousand um, dollars. We shot in a real mine at less than, you know, less than a tenth of that price, and you couldn't you couldn't get the detail that you got in a real mine. You know, shooting uh, underground was an amazing part of the experience. Plus, it was June, and and shooting underground was awesome because it was always like fifty degrees. <laughs> it was always the same. So you know, you'd be sweating up top, and it'd be humid and horrible. But underground, it was just Perfect. I enjoyed all the days shooting, shooting in the mine. The mine that, that we shot in had been an old coal mine. They had stopped it. They had turned it into a teaching mine. So it was a, it was a place where the local communities would take kids for field trips and things like that. And within 30 feet from the entrance, you were in the mining area that, that we shot. There are parts of that mine that go really deep that you don't want to go into. We've scouted them and wandered around in the dark and that part was a little terrifying but where we were was not the exterior mine that you see where it says Hanager mine and in the big sort of mine coal fields that's a much bigger operation that one is something like i think they drive these a little electric cart all the way to the coal face it was something like you know, a mile or so into the mountain to get to the coal face. But, uh, you know, we could literally walk in and be in, in inside the mine. You know, the, the a lot of the place where we staged our action was that uh, had the largest height at about maybe six foot three for clearance. You know, little pieces can fall off when you go down. Everybody had to take a mine safety class before we entered. So including the cast. You had to wear uh, helmets uh, all the time unless you were, you know, the actors. And it was constantly sort of dripping, you know. It was just sort of, if it would rain above, it would drip more uh, moisture as it comes through. Overall, it was very safe, and, and the, the air air quality, uh, you know, we only made it worse when we would smoke it up, you know, use a lot of atmosphere smoke for lighting purposes. But overall, uh, it, it was a very sort of safe odd alien environment um, to shoot in and, and it was uh, it was a very creatively inspiring place to be uh, certainly for the film it, it made the whole thing feel a lot more real um, I know in reading about uh, at the entrance 25 feet of the entrance we could turn on the cameras and, and get visually like we were like we were 100 feet down I think in, in, in 2009, when we came out, I think the J-Horror stuff was still going. Um, the Strangers probably had not 
saw the, the sort of torture porn things were going, the J-horror that had sort of faded, like the ring and the grudge and things like that, and the hostile and, and uh, saw and things like that were out. And we wanted this to be a fun movie. First and foremost, the movies of, of that era were murder mysteries. Um, you know, uh, The Prowler, Happy Birthday to Me, the, all the ones I mentioned before, you know, Terror Train, Prom Night. That was something we pitched them very hard that we, we wanted to retain that. You know, there was a version, the very first version of the script, Axel, who's the killer in the original. It was the original killer in our version as well. Um, and we changed that twice. The second version, it was just Harry Warden. And then the third version was the version that we made where Tom and Harry had sort of uh, become one through Tom's psychosis. But yeah, we were we were sort of a step out of that from the hostels and things like that and very much wanted to make something that was, you know, nothing says date movie like a 3D ride to hell, <laughs> which was an ad campaign that we we actually thought was pretty awesome because you know, we wanted something that was was that had a wider appeal, I guess, that people could have more fun with. My bloody Valentine 3D. Nothing says date movie like a 3D ride to hell. Uh, Todd came on on the film. Uh, Zane Zane Smith wrote um, the first drafts. So in Zane's version, the killer was Axel. It was a really gritty and very sort of still a little torture porn ugly. I think the studio had a hard problem with how brutal it was because he had Harry Warden locked up in his in his basement for 10 years <laughs> uh, and would torture him every day. <laughs> um, and it was sort of like, oh, yeah, that's pretty, pretty crazy. So when Todd came on, everything just became more fun. And it was at the end of the writer's strike because what happened was is, uh, Zane handed his draft just before Halloween in 2007. And then the writers went on strike until, I think, February of 2008. Um, Lionsgate settled early, and because Lionsgate settled their own deal with the writer strike, uh, we could bring on a writer sooner. I'd been talking to Todd. Todd and I had been friends for a number of years and sort of pitched him a bunch of the things that I had wanted to do with the story, but we hadn't been able to write, particularly like the cage sequence, Tom being the killer. Todd, what he did is he, in his drafts, made everything a lot more fun. And really understood the genre, had a really keen understanding of the genre. And uh, so when he came on, the tone and the timbre of the movie changed to pretty much what it is. And that was really helpful. The characters started to gel. Patrick and I had met on Scarecrow, which later became Messengers. And then we sort of stayed in touch off and on. And then he was working on a, uh, he was working on a movie for Lionsgate. And he was doing some very quiet uh, reshoots. And I had reached out to him and he said, can you take a look at the scene? Cause I shoot it tomorrow. And I did a real quick polish, a friend polish. And he went back and uh, shot it the next day. And then a few days later, he sent me another scene. And so we just sort of went back and forth. And I think New Line knew that we were doing that. I never got, you know, I never got anything out of it. I never got any money, any thank you or anything, but I think they privately, you know, were thankful. And so when he was working on Valentine, it was and it was a very different script is what they had. It was uh, the killer was a fireman. It took place in a pulp mine. And uh, so he asked me if I would consider rewriting it. And so I said, sure. You know, we had it all. We had the script all worked out, knew what we wanted to do. Kept uh, the original writer. I'd come up with this nice little love triangle, you know, with Kerr's character being the sheriff, which was sort of unique. And so we kept all that because it was great. And uh, it was fun to write because Patrick and I had, had been bouncing back and forth for a long time. And so we sort of were finishing each other's sentences by that point. I'd seen the original years before, and I did not go back to it while I was writing. I was a big fan of it. And so I was just going by memory on a lot of it. Their movie was, was the first 10, 15 pages of our movie. And then we go off in a different direction. But yet we're using all these moments that were in the original movie just sort of to pay tribute to it. What I, I loved about the, the original movie is that the kids weren't kids. They were all young adults. It wasn't your typical slasher in that, you know, a bunch of young virgins go out into the woods. It was, you know, these guys had jobs. They were real people. And I liked that. And so that allowed us to have a lot of fun with, you know, the cliche of adults versus teenagers, which was nice. 
And of course, um, one of the things when, when Todd showed up, we'd written this part of Frank the Trucker had this huge sort of sex scene and Frank was a bit of a jerk. And when we had written the part of Frank the Trucker, which was, you know, Frank it was going to have partially naked or completely naked and have this ludicrous sex scene and then had to be brutally murdered. And we had looked at a couple of different people to play the part in Pittsburgh. And one of the things a lot of people did is they played Frank really mean and, and cruel and tonally that's wrong. I remember calling Todd up and saying, hey, Todd, what, what would you feel about being in the movie? Uh, sure. Yeah. What, 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 well, what do we feel about playing Frank? Because I think I can, I can trust you to, to be you know, generous and kind to the actress and to really help her and, and to really get the tone of the scene and to really, you know, your whole goal will be trying to make the scene the best it can and you're, you're not going to be worried about being naked. Of course, totally didn't even consider that he might actually be worried about being naked. Um, uh, the studio wanted to go with a local for that part. The part was, I mean, if you've seen the movie, there's there's sex, and there's also, there's blood, and there's gore. And that was the thing that concerned me. For Patrick, it was that, the, you know, the guys that he were, was auditioning, they were all making it more about themselves than they were about Betsy, and it needed to be about Betsy. And Patrick knew I would do that. At the same time, I was worried that, you know, shooting a, uh, an effect scene is tough because you get covered in blood, and then you got to rush over and take a shower and get your clothes back on and then run back in and get covered in blood again. And it's just, it's exhausting. If you mess it up, you know, you lose days. And so I was complaining about it. And Patrick's like, yeah, I know. Will you do it? I was like, oh, oh okay. Doing a full nude sex scene, not nearly as fun as it sounds. Especially when you've got a room full of Teamsters and, there's, you know, you turn over and there's a boot right there and there are people all over the place staring at you. Jensen Ackles is right out the window pretending not to look. It's a, yeah, it's a weird thing. It's like anything else. The first, you know, the buildup to it was horrible. You know, the first, you know, 30 minutes of it is just, is just, <laughs> just, I mean, it's as uncomfortable as the scene is because, you know, it's, it's an uncomfortable thing to be in. And we, Betsy and I had talked about it and Patrick was like, you know, do what you do. He wasn't going to get involved. He's just, you know, do your thing. And so we decided to just make it as real as possible and not in a sexy reel, but just real. You know, I'm on her hair. You know, it's just everything about it is not supposed to be sexy. You know, it was a long scene because we'd sort of choreographed this whole thing that we were going to do, and it seemed to go on forever. What people don't realize is, is the scene lasts, what, 30 seconds, and it's done, but we shoot it all day long. When you first start shooting, you're like covering yourself the moment they say cut. But by the end of the day, you're just walking around nude trying to find something to eat. And everybody's like, please put your robe on. And so everybody got to see all of Betsy and I. The idea of, of having Irene, you know, Betsy's character, uh, completely naked in the scene, except for the shoes, was actually Betsy's idea. Uh, when we were doing the auditions, it wasn't quite written that way. And her assumption, you know, she said in the audition, she said, well, she's going to, I'm going to be completely naked. I was like, hmm, okay. Um, and I pitched that to the studio because I said, you know, this is who we want to hire. She's, she's got all the right energy and, and is so not a victim. You know, isn't going to be somebody screaming in the corner and, you know, is going to fight and isn't going to break down and cry and somebody you're gonna, really going to root for. And she wants to do it completely naked. And their response was, oh, would she do that? I mean, what? Really? Well, absolutely, we want that. <laughs> it was like, okay. And Betsy's philosophy at the time that I remember her saying that she'd been in another movie where she'd been cut out and she had always been, was mad at that. And then and her response was, nobody will ever cut out the naked girl. So I will be naked and I will be in the movie. <laughs> and by God, she is. The gore and sex were there in droves in My Bloody Valentine 3D. But the MPAA hadn't gone away and still had to be contended with. The MPA is always in the back of your mind. Sometimes it's in the front of your mind. You always have to, you know, having gone through Scream, uh, I know Wes Craven's new nightmare, and having heard all the stories that Wes had, you know, the challenges he had faced all the way back to uh, Last House on the Left, they would go after him. They had different reasons why. They weren't just, it wasn't just about the content of the films. But that was always something we faced. And certainly on screen, when we went back nine times, that was a big deal, trying to get the movie as close to the version Wes wanted as possible. And on Scream 2, we did something very different. We cut a version of that movie that was deliberately over the top. 
that was so much more violent than what was released in theaters. You know, Omar Epps gets stabbed in the head like three times. Jamie Kennedy's death scene was like a massacre. That's the version we sent them, but it wasn't the hero version of the film that we'd been cutting. We had a totally different version that whatever notes the MPA had on the cut, because the cut was so extreme, we were already ahead of them. So when we did My Bloody Valentine, I, I adopted that same approach. We also had the advantage of the movie was shot in 3D. And at the time, you know, we were early days of 3D um, and it was native 3D, so shot with 3D cameras. At the time, the MPAA had no way to screen uh, 3D in their facility. They had to come to the post facility to Technicolor and view it at Technicolor. And by virtue of that, we had our color timer uh, was in the room with them. So it was the first time we actually had somebody in the room watching their reactions to the film. You know, what are the parts where they, you know, where they entered in, you know, lots of feedback, like, oh, my God, and what parts were they actually seemed to enjoying? And apparently they actually dug the film a lot. But the, the title was My Bloody Valentine, and that really informed us of everything we were making, that we were going to lean into that as far as we could. We stacked the nude scene, the sex scene. Um, the original version of the sex scene is about three or four times as long as what's in the movie. It was never going to be in the movie. What's in the film is the version we always wanted. What we put in was a whole take, the very first take. Todd Farmer, who plays Frank, and Betsy Rue, who plays Irene, uh, had sort of figured out this hysterically funny choreography that they didn't tell any of us about. They said, just film it and go with it. So we had the, the sort of steady cam rig. Uh, Howard Smith, the camera operator, just sort of followed them around as they did this absolutely hilarious sex scene. And for the MPAA, we left the entire thing in. It goes on forever because we choreographed this whole thing. I know there was one point when she yells, no, no, that's the wrong hole. And I know all of that went to the MPAA. And they apparently, you know, were making a few notes here and there until that scene came up and they every single one of them started writing about it. And they came back with the notes of, oh, that's too long. So it's like so excessive. And so we just then showed them the version that we wanted to go with. And they were like, oh my God, yes, that's it. Yes. And they gave us the rating we wanted. Um, the only other trim we had to make, we had to trim nine frames from Kevin Ty's death from him getting the pickaxe through his head when it's uh, stuck into the floor. But the rest of the film is intact. So, uh, that was something we deliberately, as we went out to you know, make the film, knowing that, that nudity might be a problem, some of the violence might be a problem, we, we stacked the deck in our favor, giving them something to get rid of, giving them a target. There was nothing subtle about it. They didn't miss uh, <laughs> what we wanted to look for. In the new take on My Bloody Valentine, the mine explosion happens again, but this time it's the fault of young Tom Hanniger. Harry Warden seeks revenge against the whole town and starts to kill anyone he can find. Eventually, he is killed. But ten years later, when Tom Hanniger returns to the town, people are turning up dead. Tom and his old flame Sarah reconnect, but she's married to Axel, the town sheriff, who has a jealous eye. There's a slew of murder suspects. There's a slew of murder suspects. But then again, Harry Warden might still be alive. The original film has a twist ending. But Lucier and Farmer wanted to put a new spin on things. That twist ending was a twist ending, I mean, right up until the day we shot it. We had it designed so that it could have been either one of them. And we, we had designed it to be either one of them. The, the tricky part was we gave Kerr the line, who was playing the sheriff, we gave him the line, you know what, fuck it, just shoot us both. Anybody who says that is probably not the villain. <laughs> so that sort of settled it for us. And then there was also the question of whether Jensen's character survived or not and that was a very late decision as well so that you see him stalking out of the mine at the end spoiler setting up a twist and, and not revealing too much is always a challenge you know i was incredibly lucky to have been mentored and worked for and worked with uh, wes Craven for a number of years we talk about you know just in cutting patterns how much is too much at what point do you know it's Billy and Stu? Do you ever know it's Billy and Stu? There's one scene we cut out of Scream, I, and I remember why 
we did it because it was a, a scene of Billy and Stu on the street. And just the way, the way they were together was a wonder. And, you know, a meeting is a single shot. And their performances were good and everything like that. But you just suddenly knew. I don't know if it was in the writing or the performance or anything. But it was just like, oh, man, we can't show that. We have to get rid of it. When you're making the film, you know, you have a lot of intellectualizing of what will tip the hand. You know, I always feel that in, in My Bloody Valentine that it's pretty obvious that it was Tom. There's not a lot of suspects. but. It almost is one of those things where it's so obvious it can't be him. <laughs> um, but certainly from Wes, you know, the idea of pointing things in different directions, keeping other possibilities, constantly raising doubt, even when you're sure you know, it has to be X, you know, offer up other possibilities, offer up and have the characters engage in that dialogue. In Wes Craven's New Nightmare, uh, there's this great shot of Julie the babysitter early on. And I remember talking to Wes about that. And it's just this weird look. And I cut it in. And I, said, and I just said to him, what, what did you tell her there? I said, well, you know, just act like you did it. Act like you're the one who's been harassing the kid. Uh, and of course, in the original draft of, this, of Wes's script for Wes Craven's New Nightmare, it was Julie, the babysitter, who was behind it all. But it was that idea of finding those little, those little bits of performance that allow you to suspect somebody. You know, we talked about that with Tom Atkins. We talked about that with uh, Kevin Ty. We talked about it with Kerr and Eddie. You know, there'd be little moments where we'd say, okay, in this take, at the end of this take, try and make me think it's you. You know, so just little things like that, um, you know, little tricks that just have enough to make you go, wait a minute, what's that look about? And it's just, a, you know, designed to throw you off the scent. It was a frustrating thing. We did do well and we had a great opening, but we were 3D. We were a fully 3D movie. I think we were the first full live action. I know that uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth had come out, but it wasn't all 3D. There were only under a thousand 3D theaters, and we couldn't be in there very long because three weeks later, Coraline was going in. So even though we were still doing very well, we had to leave the theaters at the end of three weeks. From that point forward, every month there were 10 to 100 new 3D theaters open. So by the end of the year, there were a ton of 3D theaters, but we never had that opportunity to even try to do a lot better, and we could have done a lot better. That was frustrating. You know, My Bloody Valentine came out and did did incredibly well. The weekend it opened, Lionsgate was under siege by Carl Icahn, and they were uh, very concerned that if the movie didn't perform, that they, the company would be in jeopardy. So the fact that it performed so well and went on to internationally make so much money as well. And Lionsgate owned all of it. They didn't have any partners. So they were over the moon about it. The studio still needed help, even after the release of My Bloody Valentine in January. In a February article of Deadline, a source said of their third quarter report, it's a fucking disaster. As the company's stocks fell, Carl Icahn bought them up in hopes of a hostile takeover. Icon, according to his website, is a leading shareholder activist. Carl Icon's efforts have unlocked billions of dollars of shareholder and bondholder value and have improved the competitiveness of American companies. In other publications, he's noted for inspiring Gordon Gecko in Oliver Stone's Wall Street. Unlike his takeover of TWA, this time Carl Icon would be thwarted thanks to an illegal trick up Lionsgate's sleeve. Here's how it happened according to Forbes. Starting in 2000, Mark Rashke began accumulating a significant share position in Lionsgate, eventually grabbing a board seat. But within a few years, Icon had also taken a big stake in the company and started to attack the management team, including CEO John Feltheimer. Icon blasted the company for overspending on things like film libraries and launched a hostile tender offer for the company. In 2010, Lionsgate facilitated the transfer of some of its debt to Rashke's funds that converted into millions of shares, diluting Icon's stake. The purpose of the deal was to beat back Icon, but Lionsgate didn't say that was the reason for the debt deals. Instead, the company said in the SEC filings that the move was part of a previously announced plan to reduce debt. But, according to the SEC's enforcement action, there had been no prior announcement that Lionsgate had planned to reduce its debt. The SEC also said on Thursday that Lionsgate falsely represented that the debt transactions with Rashke 
were not prearranged and failed to disclose the extent to which it enabled the debt transactions with the expectations that Rashke would get the shares. After the debt deals, Icon continued to battle Rashke and Lionsgate in court, but eventually he relented and sold his stake, much of it to Rashke for $7 a share. What happened next had far-reaching consequences in both Hollywood and Wall Street. Rashke became chairman of Lionsgate, the Hunger Games series became a massive hit, and the company bought Summon Entertainment and its Twilight franchise for $413 million. The stock of Lionsgate soared. Rashke's funds have made a paper profit of about $1.5 billion. But there was a bit of a, a regime change in, in the hierarchy at Lionsgate at the time. I think they switched to making movies like Killers and Next Three Days and things like that, and they were trying to sort of phase out genre movies. We had 30, 40 pages uh, of an outline scriptment, you know, part treatment, part script, for the sequel, what the sequel would be. Um, but we had it all, you know, worked out and had pitched it to them and were ready to go. I think Mike Pasternak and John Sackey were both on board. But ultimately, Lionsgate itself decided that was not the direction they wanted to go with a company, which surprised us. We, we were completely ready to lead back in. The cast was ready. You know, we had a pretty affordable yet, yet elaborate and cool sequel that kept everything going with Harry Warden and, and where Tom would go next. And, uh, and ultimately, they decided they, it wasn't what they wanted to do. So, you know, every, every couple of years, we would go back to them and say, are you sure you don't want to make it? Um, you know, we still have this idea. Um, uh, even recently, I was meeting them over at Lionsgate there and talking about something else. And they, somebody started talking to me about, you know, we've been thinking about my bloody Valentine. And I just laughed. And I said, hey, great. Well, let me know what you want to do. I would, you want us to get involved. That was a bit of a shocker to us all because we thought that was going to be a done deal and we were going to be uh, steadily employed on the continuing adventures of Harry Warden. Uh, and uh, that didn't happen. It's one of those things where you're just sort of like, but, but, but wh why for we no make that? <laughs> uh, that's see, it seems really simple and we pitched them like a you know a cheaper version about five years after the fact and came up with a way to do it and and um they're like yeah yeah there's no appetite here for that we're, we're gonna keep making hunger games movies and things like that so that was also the challenge right as the you know uh, granted killers in, in next three days may not have been very successful once they got into hunger games that that you know those were incredibly successful uh, successful films and very very well done and and so that that sort of shifted the focus of the company again uh totally get that um i think if the last sort of revisitation of the saw had uh, made a hundred million dollars or whatever that that might have opened the door for valentine one more time but as it is i'm not i know i'm not sure if it won't be handed off to somebody else to come back and, and, and dust off Harry Warden and, and, and run him around the park one more time. And so Harry Warden was once again doomed to a life without a sequel. But never say never. I am now working on a, uh, on a sequel to My Bloody Valentine that hopefully maybe will get made soon. <laughs> Once upon a time, on a sad valentine, in a place known as Anniga Mine. A legend began, every woman and man would always remember the time. And those who remained were never the same. You could see the fear in their eyes. Once every year, as the 14th draws near, there's a hush all over the town All the legend they say on a Valentine's Day Is a curse that'll live on and on And no one will know as the years come and go Of the horror from long time ago Twenty years came and went and everyone spent the 14th in quiet regret And those still alive know the secret survives In the darkness that looms in the night For oh, the legend they say on a Valentine's Day Is 
a curse that'll live on and on And no one will know as the years come and go Of the horror from long time ago In this little town when the 14th comes round There's a silence and fear in the air Remember the morn that the legend was born All the shock and the horror was there For oh, the legend they say on a Valentine's Day Is a curse that'll live on and on And no one will know as the years come and go Of the horror from long time ago And no one will know as the years come and go Of the horror from long time ago 